good to know. Hi, I'm Justin Wages from Placer Land Trust, land manager. I'm Damien Ciotti with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm a restoration biologist. And we're here at Doty Ravine Preserve, uh, just outside of Lincoln. Uh, it's 426 acres of vernal pool grassland and riparian habitat and a little oak woodland habitat as well. So we're doing a little staff meeting out in the field. Uh, I wanted to show uh, staff members that don't get to come out and play in the, the wildlands all that often um, what it is we're doing out here and why it's important. So this area in particular is part of a floodplain. Uh, there's 20 acres just upstream of me and about 38 acres downstream of me that was part of a historic floodplain that uh, had been disconnected from Doty Ravine. Uh, what was that? maybe 1880 or 1890? 1880s when the uh, uh, levees were constructed. Right, using oxen of all things, that's uh, pretty interesting that we found through the archeological survey. But uh, the stream was disconnected from the historic floodplains um, and used for agriculture. And what we're trying to do here is to remove sections of levee that, uh, that are mostly level with the floodplain to uh, help capture storm water and divert it out of the creek into the floodplain uh, and restore that natural balance. Uh, so we teamed up with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and their partners for uh, partners program um, to take a look at the area, map it out, and figure out where we can make the biggest improvement for the least amount of money, and uh, using beaver to uh, help us to do that. Um, they know the system better than all of us, no matter how many studies we do, uh, and they, they work really hard. So uh, we figure let's utilize their you know, natural work ethic to help transform this place back to what it was originally uh, and you know, help with that stormwater runoff and to get some more habitat built up in here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and from the, f uh, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we've uh, been really excited to be part of this project because uh, it's an opportunity to reconnect a floodplain to its stream. And from what we know about uh, wildlife and fisheries habitat in the Sierra Nevada um, and in California, the most diverse habitats are in these low gradient floodplains where we have streams reconnected to the floodplains because the stream is always uh, uh, moving across the floodplain. If it can reconnect, it will move and it will create and maintain complex habitat throughout the floodplain. And we are just seeing that today, just with new, new willow that are establishing here on the sandbar. And Justin mentioned that we didn't plant those. No, we didn't. Um, and uh, it's because the creek is, is depositing new sediment here and, and allowing for uh, these conditions to exist to um, uh, create new forest habitat right, right here along the stream. And, and the beaver have been uh, a, a major, a significant, played a significant role in, in making that happen. And they, uh, they've been restoring and maintaining while we're not even here. So no, no construction contractors to oversee. Right, gotta love these little guys. <laughs> so I'm trying to, let me try to paint a picture because um, I've been working on this property since 2007. And there was a really great aerial video, I think Placer County or, or one of the watershed uh, protection groups had done in 2005 where they did a flyover of all the Placer County streams. And I remember watching that video from 2005 and I saw the stretch of Doty Ravine. Downstream there were plenty of trees, there was ag on either side, but there was a, an actual riparian corridor. As soon as you hit Doty Ravine, the trees disappear. And there were, you know, a handful of trees out here. And then as soon as you got off the property, there were a ton more trees. And so we knew we had to do something about it. Um, so in 2008, we planted 5,000 trees and shrubs on this northern floodplain section where there was no levee. Um, and in, a, in hopes of trying to rehabilitate and get that habitat you know, back in here. And what was really interesting is how much water that area held. So pre-restoration, during this time of year, it would be completely mowed down, brown, star thistle, there's just not much going on except, you know, maybe jackrabbit haven. Um, but since 2008, if you look behind us here, you can see what, what are those 40, 50 foot tall cottonwoods? Um, and then there's a pond below that that the beavers have actually built in the floodplain. Uh, and we're still waiting for a lot of the oaks to grow up, but you can see it's completely transformed that area. Uh, 
And that's what we're hoping to do onto the lower floodplain section, which is actually even larger. Uh, and what's really neat about it is there's two things. Um, one, instead of it being dried up uh, and, and pretty much no habitat value and very little feed value for livestock, is now that it stays green year round, we can actually move cattle back into these areas to get a little bit more feed, a little more protein before they're moved off the property. So there's an ag component that's really beneficial. Uh, and now we have a ton of wildlife. We got deer, sea otter, or sea otters. Well, that would be really interesting. <laughs> Sorry, river otters. <laughs> They're still interesting. Um, you know, we just saw a heron fly by. I don't know if that was a bittern or if that was a, a night heron, but anyway, um, tons of habitat value. And we want to see that same thing on this other side. And that's why we're partnering with Fish and Wildlife Service to, to try to get that component over there and trap some of that storm water sink it in the ground, help our groundwater uh, issues and flood control. Yeah, yeah, I mean the work the work Placer Land Trust has done on the other side of the floodplain is really uh, one of the great uh, reference sites we use not only for for this site that we're working with you to restore but also just a vision for for other places in the foothills of, of how we can restore uh, and reconnect floodplains uh, along streams and rivers because uh, you know it's it's really tremendous what's happened there just over I think a matter of seven or eight years I think yeah uh, I mean it was basically a dry pasture um, that you know had some oaks and now it's a full bottomland uh, deciduous complex floodplain forest <laughs> exactly. so and and this uh, stream, I think, gives a good indication of what's happening here. I mean, this used to be a straight creek right through here, and now you see a, a quite a meandering stream system. And it's not only that, but there are two there are two streams coming together here now. This used to just be one creek coming straight down through here, and now we have two two creeks. Sorry, Zaya. Um, and that's that. The, these are these are really important. Um, uh, ecological indicators for us the more the more stream length we have like meanders and then you have you now you have the creek is uh, separates and then comes back together at a confluence these are all really important ecological indicators of, of better habitat for from our standpoint and uh, so it's great to see it happening I, I wanted to point out too um, so the one problem with beaver is you can't just stop them from eating trees and you can't always choose which ones they can take and which ones they can't. They don't really listen very well. So um, we had a Girl Scout come out and do her, I think it was her gold award or silver award project. And she wrapped a lot of our more precious trees, uh, the larger oaks, our walnuts, things like that, uh, with chicken wire and fencing of various sorts to keep the beavers from eating them during this establishment phase. Once you have enough trees in here, you can actually support a beaver population and they're not <laughs> gonna completely denude the area. Um, and so that's one thing we always kind of go back and forth on, especially with the rancher. I love them to death and I would get on them so hard when their cows would knock over one of my little baby oaks or a walnut. <laughs> and so I'd make them give me steak, you know, in case, you know, they, they eat one of my trees. That was our trade off. So when you would see the beavers taking out one of the trees, they would always call me and say, hey, well, what are you going to get for that? A beaver pelt? You know, well, just I kind hear, of a joke. I hear beaver tastes pretty good, actually. According to uh, the beaver experts uh, from uh, the uh, that are from the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, they're promoting uh, the uh, really beaver recipes now. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so uh, what I found interesting is that I don't even know how I'd cover that one. Um, is the fact that even though they do take out some of your trees, uh, we have a lot more water in the system now. So um, downstream, I can see some alders that have died from too much water inundation. But overall, we're going to have an expanded area where the trees can grow. And what's really interesting, I don't know if you want to look here, but I just noticed here in this sandbar, um, you want to come this way a little oh, bit, yeah, is we had willows popping up. So we didn't plant these. Um, the beavers, I'm sure, have taken out a number of willows. They've tried to get this one downstream here probably six or seven times, and it keeps growing back, uh, the tall one there. Um, but because of all that extra water, the plants just keep growing. And eventually, the beaver aren't going to be able to keep up. And so if you see right over here, I actually have a little cottonwood now growing. 
Got so it. with all that extra water and that habitat complexity that Damien was talking about, you're gonna have these natural recruits. We don't have to keep planting out here. Once you get it established and managed, it's going to take over and then management is minimal. Um, and so that helps to take out uh, or to uh, compensate for the trees that they do take out. So to me, this is a, a really good success story in the making. Uh, we've been documenting the progress and it's gonna be really, really cool to see this place in another 10 years when all this behind us is as wet and biodiverse as what we have upstream. Yeah, any questions? No, rest of Placer Land Trust staff, no questions? So, yeah, so Justin, what you're saying is that nature's just going to take over and do its thing because we've added water back to here? Mostly. We'll still have to worry about invasive species like blackberry, pokeweed, things like that. Um, but we're, we're essentially trading some non-natives or invasives for other ones that are more beneficial. So we're going to have some in here, but that's okay. Nut sedge, you know, isn't necessarily the best thing or the primrose, but because of all that extra complexity, we end up with a net gain or what you would call uh, in ecological terms, a functional lift um, from where we started. So I like to think of it as choose my battles and essentially do the best that we can for the most amount of species on the property uh, and the most resiliency we can get out given climate change issues and flooding, that sort of thing. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for joining us out here. I'm super stoked that it wasn't just us, that we actually got to reach out and show some of, show some of you uh, what it is we're doing out here. So hopefully we can do a tour and, and show uh, what it looks like in another couple of years. And why don't you share the website where people can donate? Uh, www.placerlandtrust.org. Uh, and I forget which link that is, but I'm sure there's a big donate now button on there. Just look for that and click it, um, you know, once a day, once a month, whatever you want to give. So uh, we can keep working on projects like this and get more partnerships and, and even scouts. And where'd she go? Young people out here. <laughs> <laughs> Smile. Thank you. <laughs>